Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today with community leaders from across our country whose incredible work is helping young Americans live a drug-free life. So important. And I want to congratulate the people in the room. And an incredible job. Nothing's easy, right? Nothing's easy, but you've done an incredible job. Today, my administration is providing a record $91 million to support the Drug-Free Communities Initiative. Grants will be awarded to more than 730 community groups in all 50 states. That's a lot of groups. That's a lot of people impacting more communities than ever before. We've never done anything to this extent. We've never done anything this large or where we reached out to so many people, great people. The Drug-Free Communities Program is a proven success, cutting alcohol and prescription drug abuse by an average of nearly 20 percent among high school students and participating communities. That's a 20 percent reduction, which is pretty much at the top of the pack. Incredible what they've been able to do. You should all be extremely proud of uh, your life. Really, this is going to be a life's work, and a very important life's work. So, great going. I also want to thank Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, somebody who really takes it to heart, and very strongly we speak, and he is in love with what he does because of the results that he's getting, and that's Jim Carroll. Jim, thank you very much. I thank you, Mr. President. Countless Americans are affected by the dangers of substance abuse. Many of us have a friend, a colleague, or a loved one who has struggled with dependency. I have. Uh, I had a brother who had a very big alcohol problem. He's a great guy, a great life, great potential, best-looking person. I have to admit, he was much better looking than me. <laughs> but he was the best-looking guy, had the best personality. But he had uh, an addiction to alcohol. It's all an addiction. And it really, uh, really destroyed his life. It's a very tough, very tough thing for our family. Sadly, in 2017, an estimated 134 Americans die each day from opioid-related overdoses. 134 people a day. My administration supports ongoing bipartisan efforts to pass legislation to combat the opioid crisis. We're dedicated to ending this crisis, and we will end this crisis, or at least we'll get it down to a level, Jim, where we can do things and maybe go from there. But we're getting it down to a level that's a lot lower than people thought possible at the time. In one year, we reduced high-dose opioid prescriptions by 16 percent. We increased funding by $6 billion to combat the opioid crisis. That's a record. Uh, we got that approved just last year, and the money is now starting to flow through the system. We declared a public health emergency and launched a nationwide public awareness campaign. We are expanding treatment and recovery support services. We're holding drug traffickers accountable for their crimes. We're really going after the traffickers. I've always said that's the biggest thing. And frankly, the punishment is getting stronger and stronger. And maybe at some point, we'll get very smart as a nation and give them the ultimate punishment. In a few moments, we're going to hear directly from the incredible coalition leaders and youth representatives that are with us today. But first, I'd like to ask a great friend of mine who's been with us for a long time and somebody that's really done a beautiful job, Deputy Director Jim Carroll, to say a few words. Jim, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it's a great honor to serve um, as the head of National Drug Control Policy for you. Um, what is also a great honor is being able to work with the communities and to work with these community leaders throughout the country. I go around the country, and in fact, I go around the world with some of the programs um, that you're putting in place. And what we're seeing is, quite frankly, people who are a bit surprised by the level of commitment that you have shown. And quite frankly, it's not just the financial commitment that we're talking about today with the record number of dollars being put towards these resources, the record number of communities. 60 million people are living in a drug-free community. But candidly, Mr. President, I think that they have been overwhelmed by your personal commitment, by your passion and compassion on this subject. When I'm out on the road, that's what I hear are people have really taken to heart the words that you have given them, in addition, of course, to the resources. 
uh, but they really understand. So I'm very eager for you to meet six of the 731 today, led by General Dean. That's right. um, and so um, thank you for allowing me. You told me at the beginning um, to be relentless, and you meant it across all three, to be help with relentless on education and prevention, relentless in making sure people get treatment, and of course be relentless on interdiction and stopping the drugs. And um, thank you for your support. We're doing all three. Thank you very much, Chief. Beautiful. General, how about saying a few words, please? Thank you, Mr. President. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for your commitment and for honoring us by announcing these grants today. Uh, since I left the Army, uh, I have been serving and had the pleasure to serve as the Chairman and CEO of Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America. It's been 20 years come this Friday. Uh, in that fight, uh, we have built uh, and had funded through the Drug Free Communities Program over 2,000 coalitions, of which there are 731 actively now. Mm -hmm. uh, working with the Office of National Drug Control Policy, we've had this program, CATCA took this concept to, uh, to ONDCP and to Congress and got it enacted into law. And over the last 20 years, working with previous administration and yours, we have kept it funded, and we are so excited to see that the dollars now are nearly approaching $100 million. I will say to you, Mr. President, that the, as you cited, the results that these coalitions that are represented here today are achieving are exceptional. I can think of no other grant program in Washington that can achieve so many results for the amount of dollars that are put into them. I would say to you also that we have helped these coalitions through our training and through our coalition academy. And I would say that if you look at the country, and you know this well, Mr. President, there are more than 3,000 counties in, in the United States, about 3,300 counties. We currently, over the 20 years, have built 731 of these coalitions. And CATCA goal would be to have one of these multi-sector coalitions in every county in America. And I would like to work with you and your administration so that we can continue to have every county in America having the, one of these coalitions that are going to help them build down their substance abuse rates. And we know that's possible, and we thank you for your leadership. Thank you, General. That's very nice. And we will be working together. Thank you so for a long much. Time. Thank you. Thank Look you. forward to it. Thank you. Now, I want to introduce a young lady who's sitting to your right. She, uh, she, she first met us when she was a freshman in high school. She came to our National Youth Leadership Academy, but we train over 2,000 young people every year Good. to take this fight back to their community. Because we were impressed with her, we asked her to become one of our trainers. She right. did that. She just graduated high school. She's headed off to uh, Loyola College. Good. She, she traveled with me uh, internationally as well, and she's a great example of what young people are doing in their communities <coughs> to fight this issue, and I wanted her to give you a short summary of what Great. she's doing. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so my name is Nanya Patia. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. And I've been working with our coalition for approximately four years now. And they've been DFC funded um, for a majority of those years. And with them, we've been able to see a statistical decrease in the use of alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco. Um, and through CATCA, as General Dean mentioned, I have the ability to collaborate with youth across our country who likewise have been funded by the DFC grant. Um, and together we are able to notice that you are giving us the power to work truly in our communities um, from a bottom perspective going up. Um, so this March, I actually had the opportunity to go to Vienna, Austria um, as the U.S. Youth Delegate uh, for the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And there I was able to collaborate with youth from across the world. And I was comparing and contrasting different ways of prevention that's done across the world. And Truly, the ONDCP's DFC grant is one of a kind because we are giving power to the local communities to do what they deem necessary. And so I truly wanted to thank you um, for giving all that power and trust to the local communities to deal with these local problems. So thank, thank you. That was so beautifully done. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I almost want to applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Well, see, now with all of these people, you're going to become very famous, and you'll probably end up being a television star, and you'll forget all about me, right? <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Really good. Thank you. Would you like to say something? Oh. That's a tough one to go <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you have a quote there, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Jacob Hewitt. I'm from Scott County, Tennessee, and I'm honored to be here. Uh, 
I have to tell you, I'm the least deserving person to be able to represent my family. And uh, for the past five years, I've wanted to do nothing but help the community. And without organizations like Stand and Katka and the, the people like Mr. Carroll and, and General Dean, it wouldn't have been possible. Uh, Stand altered my life. Uh, my family, they have a long history of drug and alcohol abuse. Mm. And uh, my parents, uh, they were the exception. Uh, and I kind of realized that the good life I've had, they weren't able to. Uh, my grandpa, he was in World War II. He uh, got wounded and he coped using alcohol in the PTSD. Uh, it was nothing for him to wake up in the middle of the night I think he was in the war then and trying to escape from the house and he'd, he'd beat anyone to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, on my dad's side, he wasn't encouraged to go to school. He has an eighth grade education. And uh, the life that my parents made for themselves, my dad's a maintenance man with the local school system and I'm proud of him. Good. And my mother is a teacher with three degrees and my entire life, my dad has pushed me and encouraged me to get an education, and my mom has taught me how to use it. And I have to tell you, without co if a coalition like Stand had existed when they were children, their lives would have been way different. And I, I will not stop advocating for my county until every child has had the same opportunities that I've been blessed with. I want to thank you for your time. Well, I have to tell you, I think he uh, maybe did just as well. <laughs> and he had no idea this was coming. <laughs> you had a little idea. He had, he had no idea. That was a great job. Thank you very much. And say hello to everybody. Yeah? Tell them we're proud of you. It's a beautiful job. How about you? Hi, okay. I'm Savannah Cooney. I'm from Raymond, New Hampshire. That's in southeastern New Hampshire. Um, I'm with the Raymond Coalition for Youth. and. My biggest, if I could give you one thing, my experience being in a coalition and the work I've done is that youth voice is vital if we're going to try to work on prevention. Um, youth are just naturally going to listen to other youth more than they're going to and to adults because they can connect to their peers. So by empowering and educating those youth that are involved with the coalition, also getting more people involved with the coalition, through community events and such, those things are so important because then we're able to give to our peers who may not have been involved with the coalition and we can break social norms and we can tell them, you know, uh, drinking and uh, marijuana use is not just a rite of passage that we have to go through. There's so many other options. And coming from New Hampshire, we do have a, in the whole country, does have an opioid crisis. And as though, although we are working directly with that, we are very certain that if we keep working with the alcohol and marijuana prevention with teens, that is really where we're gonna find, um, that's the start that then becomes an opioid crisis. So as, although we have to work directly with the opioid crisis, working with the prevention of you know youth using dr um, alcohol and marijuana is just as important right. because that's where it all starts. Great and job. thank you for your time. It's really nice. Thank so it really is having an impact. Yes. That's great. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Hello, I'm Sarah Corvus. I'm with the Jackson County Anti Drug Coalition in West Virginia. Um, all I'm going to say is with this grant, we have seen such a major change among our youth and our county. And it's been like, it's crazy because we see it all the time and we see people change their minds and see people change their lives because of, because of what we're doing. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just great. Great place for us to be here. Just left. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. You're really very inspirational. We're going to stay around and talk a little bit. And we'll let the media leave. I hope you miss the media when they leave. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate those few statements because they were really beautifully delivered and said. And I know they're said from the heart. So thank you all very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Don McGann's a really good guy. Uh, been with me for a long time.
time, privately before this. He represented me. He's been here now maybe almost two years, and uh, a lot of affection for Don. And he'll be moving on, probably uh, the private sector, maybe the private sector, and he'll do very well. But he's uh, he's done an excellent job. Any concern about what he said to the Mueller team? No, none. None. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. How's that going? I knew he was going. Also, you know, as you know, I had to approve it. So uh, and, and we didn't we didn't claim executive. Uh, no, I don't have to be aware. We uh, we have uh, we do everything straight. We do everything by the book. And uh, Don is an excellent guy. Yes, go ahead. Trade talks in Canada, Mr. President. How are they going? Do I think they're going really good? well. Canada is uh, here right now. They were here till late in the evening. They came to see us. They wanted to meet us. Uh, they want to be a part of it. The deal we made is a fantastic deal. It's gotten great reviews with Mexico, the trade deal. Right now, we call it the U.S.-Mexico trade agreement. And we'll see whether or not Canada gets into it. Otherwise, we'll do something separately. Or we won't do anything, which is okay, too. Are you optimistic? I think so. I think Canada very much wants to make the deal. And I think it's going to be obviously very good for Canada if they do. And I think it's probably not going to be good at all if they don't. We have uh, a very good relationship. They came yesterday to the White House. And we negotiated late into the evening. They're in the White House right now. We're negotiating with them right now, and they want to be a part of the deal. And we gave till Friday, and I think we're probably on track. We'll see what happens. But in any event, uh, things are working out very well. A lot of trade deals are working out well. The European Union, which really has major barriers to trade. You don't know what barriers are, but it's not good. Not fair for our farmers and others. Uh, those barriers will be coming down. And as you know, we're in the midst of a very big trade dispute, to put it nicely, with China. And I think we're doing very well. You know, our economy has picked up in terms of worth. There's a lot of money for everyone sitting around this table, but we picked up about $10 trillion, General, since uh, my election. <laughs> and we're doing record business, record stock market, record everything, and also record unemployment which, you know, from the standpoint of a lot of people, we're talking about prison reform and other things, but when people come out of prison now, they can actually get jobs, and they're really liked by a lot of the employers. Many, many — we've had tremendous success. We've never had that before. Part of the reason is the job market is so good. So all of a sudden, employers are hiring people that maybe they would not have given a chance to, and now they're hiring people, and it's worked out incredibly well. You're one of the great yeah, advocates. I know. Right. Very, it's never been like this. So it's, and, and I have to tell you, I know employers that have hired people and given people a second, and a couple of cases, a third chance, in all fairness. And they are so happy. Not in all cases, but nothing is in all cases. They are so happy with so many of the people. They said, we'll never lose them. They'll be with us for a whole lifetime. So it's a beautiful thing to see what's happening. And uh, again, with uh, Canada, uh, I think we're doing very well. Do you think we're going to say that Andrew Gillum down in Florida with Ron DeSantis? No, I didn't hear it. You endorsed and said that it's not time to monkey around with the economy down in Florida. No, I, I didn't hear. Honestly, a, a racist comment. Yeah, I didn't hear that, Jim. I mean, I've been now. I've been actually working on the deal with Canada, so I have not heard it. I tell you what, uh, I know Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is extraordinary. Uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, brilliant. Uh, ran an incredible campaign. Uh, really. Uh, beat a lot of people that he wasn't supposed to beat because he came into the race and a lot of people didn't know him. He's an extreme talent, and he will make a fantastic governor of Florida. So I think Ron is uh, — he's extraordinary in so many different ways. I haven't heard that at all, now. Mr. President, 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 Mr. And he is very happy with the job we've done. We have put billions and billions of dollars into Puerto Rico, and uh, it, it was a very tough one. Don't forget, their electric plant was dead before the hurricane. If you look back on your records, you'll see that that plant was dead. It was shut. It was bankrupt. It was out of business. Uh, they owed tremendous amounts of money. They had it closed up. And then when the hurricane came, uh, people said, what are we going to do about electricity? That wasn't really the hurricane. That was gone before the hurricane. But we've we put a lot of money and a lot of effort into Puerto Rico. And I think most of the people in Puerto Rico really appreciate 
what we've done. You know, Texas healed quickly, and the people were incredible. Florida healed quickly, and everybody worked very hard. Puerto Rico was actually more difficult uh, because of the fact it's an island. It's much harder to get things onto the island. With Texas, you're land-based. With Florida, you're land-based. Puerto Rico is a very difficult situation. I only hope they don't get hit again because they were hit by two right in a row and really the likes of which we have never seen before. But the people of Puerto Rico are great people. They work very hard. But Puerto Rico, I would say, would, was by far the most difficult of the group. And, you know, right now, FEMA and all of the people that work so hard there, they were very brave and they have done some job. But Puerto Rico had a lot of difficulties before it got hit. And we're straightening out those difficulties even now. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. We're doing well with North Korea. We'll have to see. Uh, I think part of the North Korea problem is caused by our uh, trade disputes with China. China has been taking out about 500 billion a year from the United States for many years, and we can't let that happen. So when we uh, started working a little bit against China, and we have a great relationship with China. I have a great relationship with President Xi. I think he's a terrific man, a terrific person. But we have to straighten out our trade relationship because too much money is being lost by us. And as you know, uh, China is the route to North Korea. Ninety-three percent of the product and various things that go into North Korea go in through China. So I think that now that we're in somewhat, I don't like to call it a trade war, and I think, you know, our country is doing very well, but China is having a very, very tough time. And I think that China makes it much more difficult in terms of our relationship with North Korea. Now, I knew that, but I couldn't wait any longer when I got in. I've been talking about China for a long time. When I came into office, I purposely didn't do much with respect to the trade on China because I wanted to see if we could work out North Korea. But when you're losing four to five hundred billion dollars a year and it's going to China and coming away from our country and our taxpayers, I can't let that go on. So uh, we are being very strong on China. I think it's all going to work out. Our country has gone up and they are, you know, they're having a hard time. But it doesn't so sound I like think North Korea is holding up their end of the deal. Uh, well, yeah, we're going to have to see. But I think China probably has a great influence over North Korea. Uh, I have a fantastic relationship with Chairman Kim, as you probably know, and we're just going to have to see how it all ends up. But I had to move on China from the standpoint of trade because it really was not fair to our country. We were uh, just pouring money. For many years, presidents, they closed their eyes. And I'm talking about not President Obama. I'm talking about many presidents. And they closed their eyes and Hundreds of billions of dollars a year was pouring out of the United States and taxpayers and everything else. Even if the so we had a negative impact on your voters, on your votes. No, I think we're going to have a very positive impact. I mean, if you look at the polls, based on the polls, it's positive. Based on the polls, it's the highest in the Republican Party, I guess, for ever or for a long time. And it's been. Uh, I, I don't do it for the polls, honestly. People won't necessarily agree with this. I do nothing for the polls. I do it to do what's right. I'm here for an extended period of time. I'm here for a period that's a very important period of time. And we are straightening out this country. And one of the biggest things we want to straighten out is what the people in this room represent. That's drug abuse and alcohol abuse and all of the problems. And I think it's something that maybe a lot of people don't talk about. You know, we'll talk about other things. But to me, this is just as exciting as creating a Space Force or sending rockets up or doing so many of the things that we're doing. Uh, so I really don't, and I can tell you this, Jim, I don't do anything for polls. I do it, I enjoy looking at polls. It's interesting to see, but ultimately, I always make a decision based on what's right and what's wrong. Right. Well, right. well, I just hope there won't be violence. I can tell you that, uh, I can tell you that because that's the way, I guess, if you look at what happens is a lot of, there's a lot of unnecessary violence all over the world, but also in this country. And I don't want to see it. Yes? May I ask you about Google, sir? What would you, Google. What would you like the federal government to do about Google? Well, I think that Google and Facebook and Twitter, I think they treat conservatives and Republicans very unfairly. I could tell you that I have personal experience. I have a lot of people on the various platforms. Uh, 
Dan would tell you probably over 100 million, over 125 million. What is the number, is Dan here? Dan? What We're is at uh, about 160 million across all the platforms. 160 Instagram, million Facebook, people. Twitter, I have Snapchat. numerous, yeah, numerous platforms. Uh, but that's a lot of people. But I can tell you when things are different. And all of a sudden, you lose people and you say, where did they go? They take it off. Now, I don't know if it happens to the other side, but I can say that with respect to Google and Twitter and Facebook, uh, there is a big difference. And in fact, I hear that they're holding hearings in Congress over the next couple of weeks. And I think it's a very serious problem because they're really trying to silence a very large part of this country. And those people don't want to be silenced. It's not right. It's not fair. It may not be legal. But uh, we'll see. We just want fairness. Do you think you want to regulate them more? Is that what you're We're just going to see. We're just going to see. You know what we want? Not regulation. We want fairness. If we have fairness. We're all very happy. But you're talking about a tremendous amount. I mean, I'm president. They got me here. Uh, you're talking about a tremendous number of people. We want to see fairness. Very important. Thank you all very much. You did? I spoke to him yesterday. We had a very good talk. I spoke to him a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And and you feel that before the end of the week you can bring know. Canada in the agreement? Hey, he called me. I didn't call him. Okay. And he was a positive call. He was very nice. Uh, he couldn't have been nicer. We'll see what happens. I love Canada. Like and you know what? I love Mexico, too. <laughs> Which one is the better? Like, they're both the same. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, come on.